Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And today, I feel so honored and blessed to have my mentor, Robert J. Lifton, psychiatrist, on with me again. I've been honored to have several interviews with you, Dr. Lifton. And I want to say before I give all of your book titles and, and talk about your latest book, I just attended a cult conference in Louisville, Kentucky of the International Cultic Studies Association. And almost every presentation referenced your eight uh, criteria of thought reform and brainwashing from your, your groundbreaking book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, the book that was used on my deprogramming back in 1976. Yeah, um, and that's very, satisfying it, to hear. Very, your and your work is now being applied to neuroscience insights into different parts of the brain, which honestly I think you'll find fascinating. When the videos go up, I'll share the links with you. But for my listeners, and maybe you haven't heard of Robert J. Lifton, I want to just stay. You are a psychiatrist and an author whose subject has been things from the Holocaust, mass violence, as well as renewal in the 20th and 21st century. Your award-winning books include Death and Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, which won a National Book Award, The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide, another book winner, book prize winner, Home from the War, Learning from Vietnam Veterans, uh, the book, the book, 1961, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, a Study of Brainwashing in China, A Witness to an Extreme Century, a memoir. Then you wrote The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mind, Hope, and Survival, then Losing Reality on Cults, Cultism, and the Mindset of Political and Religious Zealotry. And what's missing is destroying the world to save it um, on, on this bio. Uh, but I read that book. It was all about the Om Shinrikyo sarin gas cult that right. you did a study on as well. But the, the most recent book is called Surviving Our Catastrophes, Resilience and Renewal from Hiroshima to the COVID-19 Pandemic. And lastly, I'll just say you're currently a lecturer in psychiatry at Columbia University, distinguished professor emeritus of psychiatry and psychology at the City University of New York. And Dr. Lifton, it was your meeting with me in 1976 that I credit for my entire career, which is now 47 years, because you said you should study psychology and explain what happened to you, to people like me. And there I was, a depressed, ashamed college dropout ex-Mooney. And I'm like, oh my God, this world-famous psychiatrist thinks I can teach something of value. And I've done four books now. So yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, that was natural advice to give because... You seem so articulate, even though troubled, uh, and I could sense you were capable of transforming that sense of being a victim into knowledge derived from having survived it. And you did exactly that over the next 46 years, as you say. So I'm little, living proof yeah. of your theme yeah. of this latest book about how survivors of tragedies and, and horrible things can use it as a growth um, uh, accelerator. Yes, this new book is very much about what can be called survivor power and the same transformation we're talking about from a feeling of being a victim, which is acted upon and helpless, uh, to a feeling of someone who can continue with the affirmation of life as a survivor with some special knowledge derived from exactly what one has 
been through in that survival, and you are a living embodiment of exactly that process. And it's been of great service to the world that you have been. Mm. Well, thank you so much. And I just, I can't tell you how much, how meaningful uh, our relationship has been over the decades. And it's kept me going. And to see you now in your 90s, yeah. Still writing books and wanting to yeah. make the world a better place and use yeah. your knowledge and wisdom, because honestly, the world needs your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, my keeping on creating ideas, in this case, a book and also articles, is part of what I am. It's my identity, and it helps keep me going. Uh in a positive fashion. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for me to do all that. Great. And uh, honestly, a lot of young people need to have role models, frankly, for, yeah. for that passion to want to contribute, to matter, to make yes. a difference. It's very important, especially with young people, to connect with them so that they become engaged. That's a big issue often for young people. Uh, it isn't that they're not in some way dissatisfied or searching, but it's hard for them to take seriously the idea that there is a path to a life-enhancing approach that can be collective and significant so if I can connect with young people, that's especially important, I believe. Uh, and we're going to um, share this video and do a blog and put out little snippets on social media and get people to realize that these themes that you have contributed to humanity and when I, I'll go back in my mind, back to 76, when I was understanding not just Chinese communist brainwashing, but also how important it is to think psycho-historically and how the invention of the nuclear bomb changed hum human psychology, where we could now imagine the total destruction of That's everything. Right. That's right. So uh, to say that one must think psychohistorically means that one must think of the psychology of people in relationship to their history. Right. And the atomic bomb was a terrible moment in that history uh, in which our relationship to the future became really questioned and questioned as a species. And that's now being literally expressed in a new film about Oppenheimer. And I've written uh, a piece called Oppenheimer's Tragedy and Ours, in which I see his tragedy in his very success. Mm. Of course, he was brutally treated and subjected to a McCarthyite inquisition, that's true, and humiliated. But uh, his real uh, tragedy lay in the fact that he succeeded in making the weapon. That's ironic, but quite true in his case. And because he succeeded, the world is endangered. And he partly grasped that and struggled with it for the rest of his life. Yeah, and I can't help but but uh, comment that we're living in a moment right now in 2023 where AI is it par parallels with artificial intelligence and the the invention of this powerful technology and and grappling with what do we do because it can really be another um, yes, terrible AI, tool. AI is very much with us and adds to the threat 
in the sense of increasingly automatizing decisions and actions. Mm. Uh, and, and that's, there's an effort to control that, but it's hard to control it with AI. And there are lots of people struggling with it, but I don't think there's anyone who doesn't feel that it's uh, an added dimension of threat or adds to the threat mm-hmm. by the very advancement of AI. Right. And, and uh, Dr. Jeff Hinton is, I believe, credited in an Oppenheimer-esque way to uh, the development of AI. And he is like, oh, my God, this is really dangerous. Yeah. And, yeah, and rightly so. It yeah. Should be. Yeah. So let's go back, because I know your latest book, you were reminding us all that COVID really was traumatizing and really disorienting us. And there are real questions whether or not we've we've actually recovered from yes. the pandemic. COVID became a catastrophe for us. Yes. Uh, and yes, there's a question of how much we recovered from that catastrophe, remembering that it was accompanied by climate catastrophe. Right. Uh, and uh, the immediacy of climate threat no longer, although climate is still more incremental than, say, nuclear, both nuclear and climate threat accompany and intensify COVID threat. And these then enter into a sense in our psyche of apocalyptic danger an apocalyptic aura, and we need the power of survivor wisdom uh, and uh, survivor uh, influence, the impact on society of potential renewal brought about by those who have been the very people who experienced the greatest victimization. That's asking a lot of survivors But on the other hand, we've seen it happen in relation to Hiroshima survivors who have been so prominent in recent UN commitment to rendering the very creating of nuclear weapons uh, as illegal and under international law unacceptable. That's a new development in which Hiroshima survivors have played a very direct and personal and prominent role. That itself is interesting. And then for subsequent generations, each has its own needs and each can embrace some aspect of that earlier survivor knowledge and recast it. Mm -hmm. Recast it in relationship to their own historical moment. That's happening. That's often a, a not entirely clear, but a very definite, definitely possible method, mm-hmm. the recasting of survivor wisdom by new generations for their own needs uh, and a- attempts yeah, and and are you familiar with the effort that I am involved with called the I Got Out movement? Uh, well, uh, a little bit. Go ahead, tell me. Hashtag I Got Out. So the idea was a follow-up to the Me Too movement where women would come forward saying, yes, I was sexually assaulted too, and to... Uh call attention and focus on 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 just how uh, prevalent it is and how people in authority were taking advantage of their their um, whether they were a clergy person or a coach or a Harvey Weinstein or whatever so the idea is to to, to have survivors of mind control cults and exploitative, you know, coercive persuasion, it, it, relationships of all types, and to normalize it and say, hey, 
You know, it happened to me too. And I'm smart and I'm educated, but it happened to me too. And there's life after cult. There's life after authoritarianism. And yes, more people are sharing their stories. There are documentaries. There are podcasts. Please. Well, that that very much is in the spirit of what I've been talking about because <clears throat> it's providing very concrete individual models people we can see and feel and identify with, models that can serve to others quite directly and quickly in this process of uh, making use of survivor wisdom. So that sounds like a very life-affirming kind of movement. It is. it is. It, it really is directly linked to all of your life work. The more I think about it, because again, going back to 76, you didn't say, you schmuck, Steve, you shouldn't have like gotten into the Moonies. You were like, wow, this happened to you. You did it to others. And what you're describing is so much more sophisticated than what I studied. You should study psychology and explain yeah. it to people. And so I've been trying to share in my books and my lectures and such that same reframing of a negative experience to, uh, wow, there's something that you can do that matters. And I'm thrilled. There are people now, Dr. Lifton, coming out of the Moonies, people born in the Moonies who are doing podcasts. Right, right. Outing. And their parents are still in, but they're like, Ugh, you know, I hated it in there. That's, that, that is impressive. That is really impressive. And uh, it's like an ongoing process with continuous models and continuously new people who can be models, it's like a quick transfer of a model to young people, still younger people who desperately need those models. Yes. So yes, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to hear about that movement, and it seems a natural outcome of all that we're talking about. And much of our discussion today has been about dimensions of the survivors, right. about survivor wisdom. Uh, and this is a new form and a new expression of a very personal kind mm -hmm. of survivor wisdom. Yeah. And that's and why in my, um, at the end of my book on um, Hiroshima, I had a very long section on survivors in which even survivors of everyday losses had some psychological relationship to survivors of large catastrophes. They weren't the same. Right. There were differences as well, but there was a certain survivor psychology that can be identified. And I think we have to constantly return to survivor psychology to keep our minds on the... Uh, ever-expanding potential of survivor psychology. And that's, yeah, and I, that's a dimension of my work. Yeah, and I, I would add that we, we meaning, uh, now I'm going to talk about people who've left authoritarianism in its a variety of forms, we've experienced losing our freedom. We've experienced losing our personal identity to have that group identity. And coming to freedom, it's we we value it in a way that people who haven't been tested, who haven't experienced that, just don't understand. Yes, and as you say, losing one's identity or having it obscured and broken down is a very powerful experience. If one can get through that and even make use of it, that's doubly affirming to others because it's uh, it's like the death and rebirth experience of almost all cultural tradition. Almost all cultural tradition has some sort of model of death and rebirth, 
with the rebirth at times enhanced by the very experience of breaking down or, as Erickson put it, hitting rock bottom before recovering and reconstituting the self. In Mm -hmm. the process of reconstituting the self, there can be a lot of power and, again, that model for others. Yeah, and I'm thinking about your book, The Protean Man, and I would say Protean Woman, and and share a little bit about your thinking about that. Well, yes, so my idea about the Protean self is a self that we all have the potential for, which is many-sided and often has odd combinations and can undergo change and transformation. Uh, It doesn't mean that it's without risk, but it means that there is uh, a way of avoiding dead ends. Uh, That protean self is likely to be most active uh, at times of great historical change or at times of some kind of catastrophic assault or breakdown. And the existence of that protean capacity is very valuable to us. Mm. And the other thing I would say is I try to carry that a little bit further and talk about what I called grounded proteanism. And that becomes a balance between some kind of stability uh, that becomes uh, a source of steadiness that enables one to undergo the experience of the protean, the experience of the protean self and the changes. Mm-hmm. So one needs a bit of grounding in order to be free and open and changeable. And if I may, um, and tell me if I'm off or if I'm spot on, but as a mental health professional, I've come to really view humans as embodied minds and look at our bodies as talking about groundedness as being an essential aspect of self. And too many people, uh, you know, ignore their body, <laughs> ignore their needs, or look at their body as something as uh, as evil that needs to be suppressed. And yeah. what I'm realizing is, you know, so much of mental health is he- having a healthy body and sleeping. For example, most people are not getting enough sleep, and yeah. it's uh, influencing their their minds. Well, the significance of the body is related to uh, the uh, aspect of self that can be more stable uh, and needs to be if the experiments of proteanism are, uh, are to be carried through. And in that self, it's, in that sense, it's part of the grounding that I'm talking about, which the protean self can't operate without. So these are interacting elements, uh, and they serve each other. They can go awry, but at least there is this pathway to grounding combined with multiplicity and change. Yeah, and I I would just add so many people are in social media, they're in the digital world, and they're not, you know, walking in nature, and they're not like hanging out with children and pets and, 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 you know, being in the real world, but somehow believing that somehow the digital world is more real than being grounded. And I disagree. I think we need to be grounded. And, and protect our environment because there are fossil fuel countries and dictators that want to distract us. I think from- it's, a con- it's a continuing struggle <clears throat> to find some combination that includes sufficient grounding and sufficient proteanism to c- 
cope with what the world threatens us with or, or offers promise to us. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's never a moment of Sartori in which we can say, aha, I right. found it. It's right. rather a continuous process we're all engaged in. And that's, after all, what life is like. So yep. and we can't be surprised by that. Yeah, so I'm going to bring up another, you know, big, because I'm looking at culture wars like crazy are being generated. I think it's part of psychological warfare, frankly, yeah. between Russia, China, and other Christian right, other activists, and attacking truth and attacking science, attacking experts. What sayeth thou? Yeah, well... um, the culture war uh, can be uh, a source of attack, and we're seeing it as exactly that. And the culture war reverts to solipsistic thinking. That's an idea I keep returning to. It's very uh, active in Trump, but also in Putin. And solipsistic thinking really means responding to the world only in relation to the needs of the self, whatever the evidence against it or the uh, whatever the uh, experience of reality of large numbers of people uh, which would negate it. So solipsistic thinking continues uh, and solipsistic thinking is in, inseparable from the big lie about the election, Mm -hmm. and therefore the reversal of the election system and uh, a reversal that uh, absolutely, potentially can destroy democracy becomes another catastrophe in terms of the attack on democracy. And for all that, we need grounding that can remain in our uh, embattled institutions. They're still there, uh, even for people like you and me to function. Uh, Our institutions and the capacity for grounding and uh, structure based on reality is still there, but it has to be, it has to be expressed and has to be expressed forcefully in innovative and always new but powerful ways. And Mm. that's what many of us are about. Yeah, and if I if I'll if I may say, you know, evidence based facts, not alternate facts, but actual scientifically valid, proven, testable facts, and also sources trustworthy sources, people who've actually spent decades studying whatever expertise they are, have done the credentialed work, written the books, written the journal articles versus just somebody spouting off that, you know, they know better because they were talking to aliens or, you know, they were channeling, you know, some beings. Well, that's why one has to keep at it. And as I say, it's a continuous process because often there's a tendency to say, well, they falsified things with their solipsistic reality. I clarified it. I put forward uh, true developments and it hasn't stopped them. Uh, It it won't, uh, and any assertion of truth won't in itself stop the falsehoods and conspiracisms uh, that are imagined, but collectively, continuously, and in various combinations of truth-telling, that democratic process of truth-telling can continue. And it's a simple and obvious idea, but Democracy does depend upon truth-telling and has to constantly defend and reassert it 
in order to defend and reassert democracy itself. And that's what I think you and I consider our work to be about. Yep. And and for me, what I've learned from field work of the last 47 years is telling, calling people names or saying they're stupid or they're wrong doesn't resolve anything in a positive direction, but taking a position of, hey, I believe this, you believe that, I'm open to being persuaded if there's evidence, I respect you, let's dialogue about it, I'm prepared to change my mind if the facts demonstrate it, are you? And Uh having more reciprocity about about this as opposed to just continuing to, to yell at each other or call each other names. The word evidence becomes very important. Evidence means uh, traditional uh, traditional patterns that suggest a special direction or uh, a sequence that one can observe and register and others can observe and register and respond to. So evidence of truth becomes crucial and one has to constantly defend that even though it seems after one or two attempts to be without effect the overall function of evidence and return to evidence and insistence upon evidence especially for people struggling to defend those embattled institutions I mentioned all that matters and continues to matter and continues to be parts of our lives. Right, right. And I guess I want to comment, Dr. Lifton. I I love talking with you always, so thank you. You know, a lot of people don't recognize how important humans depend on our emotions, and they can be evidence-based in terms of intellectual facts, but without realizing, you know, strong emotions like fear or disgust or hatred can short circuit our ability to think about evidence. Yes, and, you're absolutely right. In other words, this is not by any means completely a cognitive and uh, idea centered process. It has to do with feeling. And it has to do with emotions very strongly. And that's why we have to recognize uh, our own struggle with emotions as we try to confront solipsistic reality. And the sense we have at times approaching despair because that solipsistic reality seems to go so far in its influence in our society. So our own emotions become very much part of the process, and we do better making use of them if we recognize our own susceptibility to emotional pain and -hmm. our own capacity to uh, re-express emotions that are consistent with with truth and truth-telling. Yeah, like love. Like yeah. loving your family, loving your friends, loving your children, loving your pets. Uh, and and I say love is stronger than mind control. And so if you have a family member or friend who's been radicalized, tell them you miss them. Remind them all the good times you had together. Agree not to talk about politics and just enjoy each other. And that will build a, a, a foundation for reconsidering and 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 again creating an exit ramp if yeah. people do realize like i did that moon wasn't the messiah you know world war three wasn't going to happen in 1977 democracy isn't satanic you know i was like how did i believe these crazy things but it was really my family's love yeah that 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 helped pull me back to reality that's right it's a 
it's a simple word, love, that may be easy to throw out, but it's profound for each of us. Uh, and it means having an aspect, a powerful aspect of the self that is life-affirming with love, love that's direct and immediate for mm. particular people, uh, and that's separate from the culture wars. That's yeah. an absolutely indispensable ingredient for all of us, I would say. Yeah, and as you were describing solipsistic um, you know, ideology, I couldn't help but think about narcissism, you know, malignant narcissists who don't have empathy. And yeah. if they don't have empathy, there's no capacity to love. It's all about them. Well, it's back and forth in which the love contributes to empathy and sympathy, and the empathy and sympathy open oneself to love. So maybe on that note we can move toward completion but uh i uh, uh, i i like what we've been talking about because it gives structure and understanding to combating the forces of destruction and one has to not dismiss them but take them in and then combat them with life affirming directions including very importantly, love. Yes, and I I just want to express my love for you as a mentor, for you, who you are, for all of your contributions. And, and again, I want to say your work continues to be taught around the world in different languages, at least in terms of the, you know, the Chinese communist brainwashing study and your eight criteria. For and and your application to Om Shinrikyo and to Trumpism, um, and I really want you to know that that you've mattered. You've you've really contributed. Thank you well, you're so saying, much. You're saying that has deep satisfaction for me. So it reverberates back and forth, and I'm very much part of it in my own uh, sense of. Uh, uh, well-being and contribution to a pattern that will become part of or is part of the larger uh, human consciousness and will continue to be that. That does a lot for me as well, Steve. So Fan thank you. Fantastic. So your new book coming out is Surviving Our Catastrophes, Resilience and Renewal from Hiroshima to the covid 19 pandemic. When is it scheduled to it's be scheduled released? scheduled for publication for June 5th. I'm sorry, September 5th. September. Uh, so we've got a little while that people can pre-order it probably. Well, um, I'm going to I'm going to get the um, publisher to send it to you. They should have before, but maybe they may some. It's all Any, good. I yeah. I have to remind you, we're going to wrap up now, but I have to rem remind you the first time I called you, you were at, you were at Yale. Yeah. And I, I said, Dr. Betty Jean answered the phone. She says, like, I, why do you want to talk to him? Oh, his book saved my life. You said, my book, which one? And I <laughs> said, thought reform and the psychology of totalism. And you said, that old book? <laughs> Why? <laughs> that old was, book, okay. <laughs> that was so funny. I was like, oh, and then I went on to read, I don't know, 16 of your books. <laughs> I've read everything you've written. So thank you for being you. We'll wrap it up now. And um, uh, please continue to write and teach. And um, we're, we're all very grateful for everything you've done, Dr. Lifton. Well, thanks so much, Steve. And uh, I'll try to continue to do that uh, for its value in all directions, including what it means to me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care. Bye now. Bye. Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, 
please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it.